Welcome to the district. The district is an inclusive community living apartment complex model designed for anyone and everyone, applicable to buildings of all shapes and sizes. It shows developers how we can design living spaces to reflect our capability to design for everyone, so anyone can build a living community that focuses on meeting the needs of every resident while creating an inclusive and welcoming environment for all. So again, welcome to the district, where our home is your home. My name is Abigail Rutman, and this is my senior thesis capstone project as part of the graduating class of 2020. I'm an interior design major and multidisciplinary arts minor, and though I love all kinds of art, this is my chosen medium to express myself. This difficult balance of creativity and intellect, whose perfect union forms my design philosophy for designing interior spaces. Let's start with what this project is and why it is important. As I said, this model apartment complex consists of what is essentially a kit of parts. Every unit and amenity space is flexible, consisting of multiple price tiers, which raise the bar from standard design to what is widely accepted as universal design, and then into what we are actually capable of doing for universal design. This allows more developers to maximize what is possible within their building constraints and budgets, while still raising the bar for what is an acceptable standard for universal designing. While the world has been growing only more and more accepting with time, universal design still has plenty of room to grow, and the people who benefit from it have a distinct need to be more welcomed, appreciated, and included in every space. This project began about a year ago while I was interning for Enberg Anderson Architecture. While working for them, we had the opportunity to design a variety of senior living apartments that had a lot to do with paying much closer attention to universal design. And while I have always had an affection for green design and universal design, working on it firsthand shed a whole new light on what I wanted to offer as an interior designer. Being an interior designer means wearing many hats, taking on responsibility for many facets of the project, and overall using our knowledge of the inner workings of buildings to build and design for the people who will be using the buildings, and overall designing better buildings for more people. Part of this is really trying to keep in mind all of the users who will use the space, and not just people who are neurotypical. While working for Enberg Anderson influenced my desire to expand on what is considered universal design, what really drove it home was my own first-hand experience in the difficulties of navigating a building that had otherwise been easy to navigate without a handicap. Last summer, I broke my wrist, and from there, although it is a very small fraction of what uh, disability could really be, I was unable to operate at a fully typical level and experienced a lot of issues within my own home and places that I have visited frequently. Issues arose in all kinds of retail spaces, my working environments, and especially at Mount Mary. I had to navigate a lot of the campus with either a cart or some other way of carrying my things because I was pretty much down to one hand. For a good four months, I had a lot of trouble navigating from one building to another, occasionally even needing to exit the building to take an exterior handicap door or use an elevator that was only accessible during certain parts of the day. After this experience, I couldn't help but feel like there could be ways that we could improve the building without taking drastic measures. The project intentions and goals of a project on this scale is to create spaces that are flexible, universal, community-driven, and aesthetically pleasing. To create flexible spaces, they have to be easily navigable in any form. This can be accomplished through many ways, such as flooring changes, audio cues, and consistent notification of spaces. Flooring changes and audio cues also factor into universally designed spaces. Simply adding one type of flooring over another in a certain area could make navigating with a sightseeing guide or stick so much easier, as different materials present different sounds based on their makeup. It is also just as cost-effective, if not more cost-effective, to switch out the standard flooring for one which has the chance to be cheaper and would allow them to navigate with a much greater ease and more self-sufficiency. Installing something such as a radio service would allow the building to have navigation, news updates, and overall narration available 24-7. It would allow all the residents to be aware of events going on, either on the residential floors or the public ground floor, and increase the community-driven nature of the district. Involving each resident with their neighbors is a key factor in this building type, as well as allowing each resident, regardless of their ability level, to interact with non-residents at any given time. All through these spaces, I wanted to make sure they were aesthetically designed, but used logical color patterns in a visually appealing way, while still being appealing to as many different types of eyes as possible.
Some functional goals I wanted to achieve were to make people feel more comfortable, independent, and entertained, which are three things I feel are key to really feeling alive in a space, and especially for a living complex where the entire goal is to live in that space. I feel as though these three things can sometimes get neglected. I wanted the objects and the design of the space to be universal and flexible, as I mentioned before, and I wanted the activities to be multi-use, communal, and overall help the residents achieve a higher quality of life. And such was the birth of the district. So as I delved into this project, I really wanted to research what universal design was, how people typically use it, and the ease at which we could expand on what is widely regarded as an acceptable accommodation in design. To create a single apartment complex, though, wouldn't impact universal design in the way I was intending. Because of that, my design snowballed in several different directions until I finally landed on deciding to build a virtual environment with multiple pieces from what is essentially a kit of parts. This would be in place of redesigning an existing building and would be presented as more of a marketing package for opening apartment complexes. Owners and designers could choose from different parts and pieces from this digital model in order to add accessibility and universal design elements to an already existing or new construction apartment building. Let's talk about what kickstarted the ideas behind this project. The intended clients and users of this space include vision impaired individuals from anywhere on the spectrum independent to live in care, deaf or hard of hearing individuals who need living and thriving spaces suitable to helping sound circulation and lip reading, and wheelchair users who need fully navigable spaces with convenient routing. With these end users in mind, the mission of the district was forged. Above all things, it highlights the independence of the individuals who live there. I wanted the building itself to have a lot of clean lines and colorful indicators so it's not confusing, regardless of the resident's physical abilities. I also wanted the environment to be clean and green, with eco-friendly design elements that can aid in human mentality and disability assistance, as well as be aesthetically designed to suit disability perception. Aspects of biophilia are overwhelmingly important to psychological and physiological human needs, and should be integrally designed in any building. I also wanted this model to exemplify community living. Many apartment complexes are satisfied simply providing spaces for individuals to live in and neglect the social need that we have on a daily basis. Living in a detached home allows for interaction with neighbors, so why shouldn't those living in apartment complexes have the same chance? Only providing sleeping quarters and lobby spaces also creates a psychological withdrawal from adventure and life as a whole, something that can be difficult to pursue outside of living spaces for those who experience difficulty navigating on their own. Amenity spaces can fill this need easily, providing activities, learning opportunities, and bonding experiences for all the residents. One of the things I researched in the name of this mission was the color scheme for the building. I interviewed several friends, peers, and acquaintances interested in the project with different types of visual impairment, and met several times with the National Federation of the Blind. After bringing many different kinds of flooring, fabric, and color samples, I eventually created this color scheme with saturated primary colors. The addition of green is helpful in every color scheme other than the ones containing pink and red, as they can often appear very similar. But otherwise, this served to complete a differentiable color palette that aids in navigation, recognition, and aesthetic appreciation. Meeting with the National Federation of the Blind and touring facilities such as the Holly Ridge Apartments for the Blind and Visually Impaired also taught me a lot about contrast and how sounds and highly contrasting colors can aid in navigation, as well as advised several layout options as I moved into the planning stages. At the beginning of this process, I began with a floor plan that I eventually cast away in order to create a more idealized floor plan, but my experiences with adjusting to the space to properly lay out apartments helped shape the final result. It also helped me to understand spatially how much space a one-bedroom takes up compared to the three-bedroom. Working in this constrained space also exposed me to the idea of adding a community space near the elevator lobby, as well as adding the idea of a porch that would provide space for neighbors to sit outside their apartment doors and chat as one night with a neighbor. 
Most of my flooring and fabric choices were advised by the National Federation of the Blind and Holly Ridge Apartments, creating a varied array of color and texture that make navigation easy both by sight and sound. Different combinations of color help me to differentiate between spaces, areas, and floors of the building. The ground floor is the only floor containing all four colors, and each space within uses a different combination of the four. As for the three resident floors, the second floor utilizes pink and blue, the third floor utilizes blue and green, and the fourth floor utilizes pink and yellow. We can now begin the tour of this facility from the ground floor. There are two entrances to the building, one off the public parking lot with access to the lobby and the public ground floor, and the resident entrance from the private parking lot with access to the elevator that leads to the resident floors. The lobby waiting area and the reception space make up the foyer. The front door leads right to the reception space of the district. Here, there's lots of very colorful contrasting signage to help guide you to the different areas, including a textured map of the public floor that can help aid navigation in a creative way, along with the typical braille that will accompany any worded signage throughout the building. From this painting, you can see the multiple floor materials that separate the public and the private areas of the lobby, as well as the color scheme presenting the branding in the background, and the presence of biophilic elements connecting the indoors with the outdoors. In the lobby waiting area here, you can see several branded community spaces that can serve as public gathering spaces, places to sit and wait for residents to make their way downstairs, or places to gather before specific classes or appointments to begin in the surrounding mercantile spaces. This is also where the texture map of the entire building is placed. The lobby is heavily connected to the pantry, which is open both to the front door as well as the resident elevator in the back. The pantry serves as a concierge service and convenience store for the residents as well as the public. It provides basic needs such as snacks, toiletries, and other products that you might find at a corner store, only they are available right there in the building. Concierge services are also helpful for residents who find it difficult to navigate on their own, as any of their needs can be brought up to them by a concierge. They would also offer refrigerated items and pantry items that are useful in smaller quantities, such as several eggs, small bags of other ingredients such as sugar and flour, amongst the traditional food and drink available in convenience stores and gas stations. The pantry is primarily dark colors and gray striated woods, with a circulatory navigation path created by a rubber floor that creates a different sound than the luxury vinyl tile that makes up the primary flooring. Of the remaining mercantile spaces, the focus settled on completing the designs of the studio. The studio is a therapy space where residents and the public can attend classes and use the spaces to add some life and adventure to their living spaces. It is split into a visual arts studio that specializes in classes that cater to any and all ability levels, and a music therapy studio that offers free music time and instrumental classes. A view into the music studio, this painting depicts the music circle and storage for some of the instruments, as well as a flooring change that acts as a kind of hallway between the two studios. Many of the surfaces within the music studio are soft, rated for acoustical protection that keeps the music studio from disturbing the rest of the public floor, as well as the resident floor above, and provides a buffer for the open concept division between the music and art studios. Here is a view into the art studio, which accommodates many different kinds of art, both for free usage by the residents and members of the public, as well as acts as an instructional space led by art therapists. The tables are height adjustable for regular chairs and wheelchair height, and the pottery wheels allow for a detachable chair or they can be used on the floor. The walls are lined with storage for art and supplies, both vertical and horizontal, and have accessible locks. The studio uses a mix of pink and blue, with light to medium toned woods and organizational storage according to the rainbow order to help differentiate colors by location rather than sight. All the remaining spaces are available both for the public and the residents of the building, and while they don't have their own paintings, many of their overall purposes and universal considerations factored into the design decisions in the following inspiration boards. The salon will feature a lot of light woods, vertical lines, and an infusion of greenery amongst the wood grain. The spa will carry that biophilic natural theme using a lot of curves and natural shadows with light and neutral colors. Additionally, as parts of the spa will be more dimly lit for meditation and relaxation of the residents, the ceiling will feature star-like lights that cycle between on and off as if twinkling.
Gym doubles as a general fitness facility and a physical therapy facility that will utilize flooring changes and LED signage to differentiate between equipment for the public and specialized equipment for therapy patients. Finally, the dining room is the restaurant included in this kit of parts, which will have an exposed brick and lighting aesthetic with a lot of dark materials, dark stained woods, and exposed ceilings for an industrial look. Moving on from the ground floor, the residential floors will have a community space accessible only by them. The garden fills this need, acting as a sort of park that spans all three floors accessible by the residents and provides a meeting space, an activity space, and a dining space. The garden resides in the center of the floors, and here on the second floor extends out over an entryway on the patio, which is a three seasons extension of the garden that provides another gathering space and a cookout area, fostering events like a block party or backyard barbecue. The garden is divided into two main areas, the grotto and the treehouse. The grotto consists of most of the garden, and is made up of a lot of medium-toned woods, green design and natural elements like hanging plants and a fake green space that serves as a library. It has a dining space with a basic kitchen and a large picnic style table that accommodates for up to four wheelchairs. It also features a long charge bar which serves as a kind of bar and casual meeting space. The other element of the garden is the treehouse, a very natural inspired fake tree that spans all three floors of the apartment complex resident floors and is accessible through a set of stairs that winds throughout the entirety of the garden and has a climbing gym within it. This painting depicts a majority of the garden. As it is such a large space, it can be difficult to capture in just one image. Overall, you can see two of the meeting spaces and the dining space, as well as the charge bar and the library. Due to the garden being the only space that spans all three resident floors, it too uses the four main colors, as well as medium toned woods, a classic black and white checkered floor for the dining space, and a patch of fake grass with a lowered lit ceiling. Finally, arguably the most important part of any apartment complex, the typical design for each suite. The district has apartments with up to three bedrooms. Each floor has two one bedrooms, two three bedrooms, and four two bedrooms that could double as a single bedroom with an office. Each of these apartments also has a space outside their front door that serves as a porch and a smaller floor specific gathering space called the backyard where residents from each wing of every floor can interact with one another as neighbors would. Here is a 3D shot of the porch and part of the backyard space, which serve as a community space for each grouping of residents. With two of these backyard gathering spaces per floor, there are a total of six mock outdoor spaces, which feature many flooring changes to help differentiate unit from unit and the backyard from the porches. A look into the layout of the three-bedroom typical, which features a full laundry room, two large closets accessible by a wheelchair, and one master bedroom with an ensuite and walk-in closet. The large living space leads out onto a balcony for all, and one of the two bedrooms has a private balcony. From inside the three-bedroom typical, this shot of one of the living spaces depicts a second-floor apartment. The decorative rafters provide sound absorption along with all the soft surfaces for the deaf and hard of hearing, and all the furniture is ADA and as universal as possible. Flooring changes between the living, dining, and kitchen spaces provide an effortless navigation aid. Green walls an example of biophilia in the living space, this wall of fake plants adds a natural air to the living and dining space and provides a lovely contrast and bridge between the living room and drop ceiling of the kitchen. The uplighting. These upward bound spotlights provide a subtle, soft, indirect lighting that bathes the room in warm yellow light and is fully controllable through audio command. It uses the rafters of the living room to bounce the light into the entirety of the room without being overbearing. The rafters. These warm wooden rafters provide a visual contrast to the light ceiling, but also aid in noise dispersion, allowing for better sound quality within the apartment. This could assist with the deaf or hard of hearing, and help be able to make out words, and the layout of the room aids in lip reading by utilizing circular furniture formations. The draft counter. Part of the breakfast bar and prep counter could be lowered to wheelchair height, allowing part of it to become ADA accessible. The rug. 
Flooring changes allow for easier navigation as well as a soft surface to absorb noise and is generally a pleasant flooring change for relaxation in the living space. The furniture. All of the furniture specified is soft surface, able to absorb noise, but is an easily cleanable blend with Krypton coating. Everything is lightweight and movable, able to be rearranged for wheelchair users, easier navigation for the visually impaired, or into formations that assist in lip reading and signing rather than speech. Many of the living areas will include a green wall of some kind, featuring both real and fake plants, and an accent wood wall that can either hold up shelving for knickknacks and photos, or could support a hanging picture frame on their own. On this floor, the residents would have blue-pink colors with high contrast, accented by reddish wood grain, and dark cabinetry with light edging around the dark handles and counter edges. A look into the layout of the two-bedroom typical, this could easily be converted into a bedroom office combo and features all the ADA and universal design components of the top tier package. From inside the two-bedroom typical, this shot of one of the bedrooms depicts a third floor apartment. All of the furniture is ADA and as universal as possible, and all of the soft surfaces provide sound absorption for the deaf or hard of hearing. The bed. While the mattress in general wouldn't matter, according to the visually impaired individuals and wheelchair users I interviewed, beds with no frames proved easier to get into. Having the ability to move directly onto a soft surface is easier and less painful of a transition. However, having a ledge beneath the mattress is helpful for wheelchair users to use as leverage when getting in and out of the chair, and those who assist with this movement also find it helpful. Additionally, all of the spaces in the room are navigable by wheelchair and all the closets are walk-in style to allow for full rotation within. The rug. Having a rug underneath the bed provides a flooring change in both sound and texture to aid in navigation as well as sound absorption with the rest of the soft surfaces in the room. The desk. Height adjustable tables are incredibly helpful for universal design. They can accommodate sitting, standing, and wheelchair users and are growing less and less expensive the more standardized they become in the workplace. The dresser. While dressers don't often cause issues with the visually impaired or for wheelchair users, as they aren't typically left open or run into, hinged doors can sometimes cause problems. For that reason, this dresser uses sliding doors for the large cabinet spaces that won't block the way of wheelchairs and will prevent visually impaired individuals from running into them. On this floor, residents will have blue-green colors with high saturation, especially compared to the gray wood grain and dark cabinetry with light edging around the dark handles and the counter edges. A look into the layout of the one-bedroom typical provides a lovely amount of space for residents, featuring an ADA, zero-clearance, curbless bathroom, a large wheelchair-accessible closet, a balcony wrapping around the living room, and a large ADA-accessible and Alexa-enabled kitchen. From inside the one-bedroom typical, this shot is of one of the fourth-floor apartment kitchens. The kit of parts provides many kinds of cabinetry and shelving that can be varying degrees of accessible and also features light edging around the countertops, under cabinet lighting, and all Alexa-enabled appliances controllable by voice. Cabinetry and shelving. The package offers three kinds of shelving, unique or mixed, that either pull down for wheelchair users, are glass for easier viewing inside, or are open shelves. Base cabinets. The base cabinets as well are available in three forms, counter only to fully accommodate a wheelchair, an angled cabinet to allow for the wheelchair to roll up without sacrificing all the storage, and full cabinetry. Edging. As mentioned before, a high contrast edging is used to help the vision impaired better navigate the countertops, being able to make out where the edge of the counter begins to where it drops off. Appliances. All the appliances within the room are either touch enabled or Alexa enabled and controllable by voice commands, all able to be viewed and controlled by a universal kitchen hub. Buttons. 
Focal controls on the appliances can only go so far though, and many of the appliances will either have manual buttons for ease of use without sight, as touch and LED screens limit their capacity to be able to be used by the vision impaired. If buttons aren't available on an appliance also compatible with Alexa, they can be superficially added afterward with braille labeling for ease of use. A look into one of the typical kitchens. It will include booth seating to be able to drop off part of the counter for wheelchair accessibility and feature ceiling detailing to help with sound reverberation that makes listening and lip reading easier within the home. Navigation paths are also dictated by flooring changes and interior doors that have heavy use will feature sliding doors rather than swinging ones to assist with wheelchair use and the ability to run into the door. To ease the use, the doors are custom-made, hollow-core veneered plywood, making them lightweight and easy to move one-handed or with limited mobility. On this floor, the residents will have a pink and yellow color scheme with high saturation, using dark cabinetry and wood grain flooring, contrasting with the light edging around the dark handles and counter edges. The following are the price tiers, dictated by Tier 1, Tier 2, and in the apartment's case, a third tier. These can differentiate between typical construction, universal construction, all the way up to advanced universal construction. As you can see for the studio, which is the combined space for both the art and the music studios, the differences between the two builds are less than $8,000. Of course, all of these numbers are construed based on estimates and do not include construction fees, but overall the design decisions that go into the floors and walls, finishes, furniture and equipment, and lighting total less than $8,000. For the pantry, which is even less involved than the studio, the difference is less than $6,000. The garden, a much larger and fully accessible space, which is intended for use by the residents, whom are assumed to have varying degrees of self-sufficiency and ability, comes out closer to $10,000. This is due to the vast improvements in the flooring, the technology of the space, the lighting, and the use of radio frequency. Finally, the most complex of the price tiers, I decided to rather than do a detailed list for all three of the typicals, merely focus on the two bedroom as a reference point, as the two bedrooms are the most prolific apartment within the entire complex, these are standard for the middle ground between the two other apartments. For tier one versus the other two tiers, there was not much of a difference between basic and universal, so the tier one includes all of the same prices as the tier two. Overall though, the jump between not universal at all and ADA and universal as a whole is around $15,000. This number is quite standard for upgrading any non-ADA home or apartment complex into one which accommodates wheelchair users, especially if residents are intended to possibly be in older age. This digit is actually quite around the ballpark. As for upgrading it from typical universal to possible universal, this jump is actually the lowest of all at less than $5,000 for improvements to the kitchen, improvements to the furniture selections, and differentiation in the flooring. In creation of this project, I compiled several boards to aesthetically display the idea of this project so they could effectively communicate the mission, problem, and solution of my project, even if I am not there to communicate it myself. Please enjoy the following visual boards. Thank you for listening. I've talked to you today about a virtual environment that I hope will serve as a kit of parts in order to spread more fully, truly universal design to as many different apartment complexes as possible throughout the world. Whether it is used on a full scale or simply for one or two of my amenity spaces, anything I can do to show the ease of designing for disability would allow me to offer my knowledge as somebody who is designed with the disabled to really give an example for what they would want to see in a space that they intend to spend all of their time. We have a wonderful opportunity to make the world a more welcoming place for all, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. Again, 
Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me.